Good evening and welcome to Spring Conference 2020. I'd like to take a chance to introduce uh, this gentleman right here to my left. Uh, his name is Nick Weaver. He is the worship pastor at East Brent Baptist Church all the way down in Pensacola, Florida. Yes, so we, it's an honor to have him. It is 82 degrees in Pensacola right now. Just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> uh, me and him, uh, we, we go way back about 13 years. Uh, we graduated from the University of Mobile in uh, 2011, and he is going to be leading our worship this week during our spring conference. So I'm going to turn it over to him, and he's going to get us started. Well, good evening, First Baptist Covington. Are you happy to be here tonight? It's going to be a great week. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand with us tonight. We're going to sing a new song for you that you may not have sung at this church before. It's called Glorious Day. So sing this with us.
Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Just stay standing with me. I'm going to read Psalm 34, verses 4 through 6. He says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. And that's what we're here tonight to celebrate, that God does hear us when we call out to him. And so he hears us when we sing our praises. He hears us when we're studying his word. And so God is faithful to meet with us tonight. So we're going to continue the spirit of praise and worship. We're going to go right into the next song. But before we do, let's go before the throne and give our thanksgiving to God right now. Heavenly Father, we love you. We are so thrilled to be back tonight. And Lord, we come with the spirit of expectation of meeting our Creator, our Father, our Savior here tonight. And Lord, we are excited to sing your praises and to hear from Rabbi Greg again. And so, Lord, we pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will stir in all of our hearts. You will bring healing to the broken. Lord, you will bring uh, joy to the, those who are sad or depressed or anxious. But Lord, above all, we just want to meet you here. We're thankful that you are faithful to us even when we turn our backs on you. And so Lord, we celebrate and we come again with open hearts, open minds, and open arms to meet you tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Sing that with us, church. Bless the Lord, oh my soul.
can clap for that. Amen. Yes. Savior, and he is worthy of our praise. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Let's just give the Lord another clap offering. <laughs> I'm telling you what, choir. Y'all, y'all, uh, really, the Lord really used you in a wonderful way. I'm so glad I'm here. I know you're glad you're here. Because you know what? The Lord is here. He is moving in a mighty way among us. Let me introduce you tonight to Rabbi Greg Hirschberg. We met nine years ago. Actually, we did not meet at a pastor's conference. I heard him preach at a pastor's conference in Nashville. And when he spoke at the end, the Holy Spirit just came over me and said, uh, you have to go forward and you have, to, you have to just stand in front of this man as he prays. And so I did, and it was just like, just like the Holy Spirit came down upon me and said, uh, you just need to listen to what this man is saying. So I was so amazed and shocked nine years ago that I called him and he called me back and he said, I feel like the Lord's given me liberty to come to First Baptist Church Covington when we were in the old church. How many of you remember the old church? Um, what an amazing journey. And I have told him this and he does not believe me. What God has done in this church, he is a part of it. Would you not agree with that church? Amen. <laughs> He's been with us five times, and he's always brought it home. Uh, God's used him in a mighty way, in a wonderful way. You love him, I love him, the Lord loves him, and he loves you, and he loves the Lord. Would you give a First Baptist Church welcome to Rabbi Greg Hirschberg? How'd that do? <laughs> well, good evening. Um, I got to tell you, uh, Chuck is incredibly near and dear to me. Like I told him today at lunch, our relationship, you and I, is like my relationship with my wife. I love her way more than she loves me. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, he loves me, but he has no idea. He has no concept how much I love him. There is nothing I won't do for him. I mean, absolutely nothing. I just po postponed a life-threatening surgery, not because I'm a great guy, because I wanted to see him. I thought if this is going to be my, my last hurrah, I really want to see him. And so I told Bernadette today, uh, my wife, I told her, you know, she goes, how did it go? And I said, it's going great. Chuck's happy. You know, he's happy. And, and that was my objective. You know, I was sitting there um, thinking, man, the, the, the praise was really good. You guys were really good. And, uh, <clears throat> I was saying, how do you follow that? <laughs> and, and not easily, you know, it's, it's, it's so much fun to, to praise the Lord. It's hard to hear a word, you know, like this morning, we spoke about why the bad things happen to good people. And uh, we use Second Corinthians. And um, this evening, I want to talk about his grace is enough or his grace is all we need. And, and again, I want to use Second Corinthians. And, you know, um, I'm not that technical. I'm not a technician, but there is a way to study the Bible. You know, there really is a way. And, and seminarians know there's five principles on studying the Bible. Because I, I just want to tell you, I don't think anybody, not anybody, I shouldn't say that. That's not true. I don't think too many people in the faith, no matter what denomination you're, you're part of, has ever been taught how to study the Bible. I think we just read bits and pieces, right? Sometimes we just open it. We go, well, I'll just open it. The Holy Spirit will lead me here. That's kind of crazy. And, and, you know, there's, there's, you, have to, you have to read it literally. You have to. There's a literal interpretation. Scripture has to prove Scripture. You have to reconcile all apparent discrepancies. If you want to read a book by a guy, Haley, there's 969 apparent discrepancies in the Bible. When it comes to prophecy, there's something called the law of double reference or a near and far prophecy. And then the most important is context. And, and people constantly just quote a verse. Well, today I know, you know, the kids, it's like the verse of the day. It's crazy. I mean, if you read a letter that I wrote to my wife, and you didn't know who I was, you didn't know who she was, meaning the writer and the recipient, you didn't know what was going on in our relationship, you didn't know where I was when I wrote it, what conditions I wrote under it, and then you take this 12-page letter that I wrote to my wife, and you take a sentence and you don't think you're going to misunderstand it and misinterpret it? But today, what do we do with the Bible? 
I mean the churches today and the churches when I say the messianic community, when I say the church, I'm not talking about a church or a denomination. When I say the church, I mean the body of Christ. Okay? When people ask me, you know, when I moved to Macon, the question is, you know, we have more churches in Macon per capita than anywhere in the world. That's a legitimate statistic. More churches than anywhere in the world. And they would ask me when I first went there, what church do you go to? And I go, I don't go to a church. I am the church. And it baffled people. And it still does. If you ask me where I fellowship, and, and I don't take it the wrong way. Don't take it the wrong way. I don't believe in membership. What, what, what? We have no members at Beth Yeshua. Are you born again? You're a member of the kingdom. And you're a royal priest. You don't need to go to seminary. I ordain you tonight. You're all now ordained. <laughs> I have the power to do that, by the way, as an ordained minister. But um, 2 Corinthians is a widely neglected epistle. Preaches very rare. Chuck's seasoned. I'm not seasoned. Ask him. You just don't preach from 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, all the time, all the time. But 2 Corinthians, hardly ever. It's because the epistle is difficult. It's a really difficult letter to understand. And Paul's very difficult. Listen, Paul, is, Paul was so brilliant. Let me tell you how brilliant he was, okay? He studied under Gamaliel, a rabbi Gamaliel. We read about that in the New Testament. Gamaliel's teacher was a rabbi Hillel. In Judaism, there's no greater rabbi than Rabbi Hillel, okay? Gamaliel was looking for somebody, a little Jewish kid in the diaspora, who he could handpick out of the tens of thousands of Jewish kids to bring to Jerusalem that he would be an understudy and potentially not just become a great rabbi, but become Israel's <laughs> next teacher, the next Nicodemus, the one who would teach the teachers. He was hand-chosen. Peter says in his second letter that Paul is so brilliant that it's hard to understand him and that those that are unstable in understanding scripture are going to misunderstand him and take him out of context as they do the rest of the scriptures. The meaning of many verses in 2 Corinthians is obscure. Paul uses a great deal of satire, but it's sometimes difficult to be sure just when he's doing this. Jews use a lot of satire. They really do. And sometimes it's hard in making people don't know when I'm being serious or I'm being funny. But by the same token, the letter, 2 Corinthians, is near and dear to me because the letter is intensely personal. And the words of that letter are the language of the heart, which is, look, I'm not that smart. I'm not. I'm not a smart person, you know? People think I am, but I've picked up a few words along the way. Then again, Jesus never used in the Hebrew language more, more than three syllables. He spoke so that five-year-olds could understand him. So if you're intelligent, clearly you should be understand simplicity. And he spoke the language of the people. Paul is a little different. But in 2 Corinthians, we get a real close look at the heart of Paul, more than in any of his other writings. We feel something in this letter about Paul's tremendous enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, entheos, the Greek word, to be in God, to be passionate. I don't have a problem. I look, I could care less about sports. I know that's, you don't say that in the South, right? That's sacrilege. I get it. It doesn't mean that if you're into sports, you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that if you love the Lord, you can't be into sports. But I watch people. I, I, I watch them. I went to my first college game uh, when I moved to Florida, University of Florida. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how passionate these people were about a game that means nothing to them. That won't change their life one iota. I have friends in Macon, you know, that fish and hunt and they get so excited. Got me a buck! <laughs> when I first moved to Macon, I saw a sign that said deer stands, $49.95. I said to my wife, who's going to pay 50 bucks to watch a deer stand? I didn't even understand the concept. But they get excited, right? I mean, some of you hunters, you get excited. Look. I don't have a problem with being passionate about things and having hobbies. I have no hobbies. I'm a very, very boring person. I don't say that to be super spiritual, but my hobby is to be in God's presence. I love hanging out with the Lord. I can't explain it. I don't know if I have to. 
I just love it. It's like I love ice cream. I could tell you why. It's creamy, it's rich, it's sweet, but I could tell you a lot of reasons. But the bottom line is I just love it. My pet peeve is how could we be so excited about sports and hobbies and not be all the more excited about the creator and the sustainer of the universe who decides to step down into his creation and make a conduit so we could have access to the Father and be able to be in communication with him. That's unbelievable, isn't it? And on top of that, if that's not enough to think that we, our righteousness is like filthy rags before a holy God, that he would house us with his spirit, and that we would be tabernacles of the Holy Spirit, and to be able to do his work, to be his hands and feet. Jesus has left the building. He ain't here. You're here. When Mary Magdalene grabbed onto Jesus and said, oh my, when he rose, my teacher, my friend, he cast out seven demons for her. He gave her freedom. And he held on. He said, woman, don't hold on to me. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was stuck in him. The Holy Spirit couldn't be at two places at one time. If Jesus was in the Galilee, the Holy Spirit couldn't be in Jerusalem. If it was, he was in Jerusalem, it couldn't be in the Galilee. He said, I have to go. Why? Because I go, I will explode. I will go back to the glory of God and I will explode the Holy Spirit and I'll send it in you and you and you and it's everywhere in the world now. Jesus is everywhere. It's incredible. It's so much more than an honor and a privilege. I can't believe, I can't believe a bum like me is even here talking to you. I don't deserve to talk to you. I don't. Who am I that you would come and, and listen to what I might have to say? I was sitting there while you were praising and begging God. Please. I just want to be eventual with this dummy. Just put me on your lap and speak. We feel something about Paul's tremendous enthusiasm he had for just the work of the Lord. We catch a sense of the honor and glory he felt for life's greatest calling, a minister of the gospel. You think a minister of the gospel, that's Chuck, that's me, that's you and me and Chuck. We read with amazement the suffering. We went over that this morning, which he endured. And we experience his extreme indignation. Yes, there is a righteous indignation with which he answered his unscrupulous critics. I don't think we would understand Paul's heart without 2 Corinthians. No, it's filled with deep emotion. In 1 Corinthians, we see the great Rav Shaul, the great Rabbi Saul, that's who he was the one who was the great teacher with his tremendous theological doctrine. In 2 Corinthians, we see Pastor Paul, a humble shepherd with the heartbeat of one who loved people and gave himself up for their well-being. Paul first visited Corinth in Acts chapter 18. It took place during his second missionary journey, which lasted 18 months. He wrote 1 Corinthians three years later from Ephesus. He wrote 2 Corinthians a year later from Macedonia, which is northern Greece. I want to ask you a question. It's not a trick question. How many letters did Paul write to the people at Corinth? Anybody know? Two? Three? Four? Yes. How do I know that? 2 Corinthians was his fourth letter. His first letter is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. In that letter, he said, I wrote you a letter previously. His second letter is our 1 Corinthians that we get a chance to read. His third letter is mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. It's right there in the Bible. Everything's right there in the Bible. You know what the problem is. We don't read it. That's the problem. His fourth letter was written when Paul heard from Titus, a spiritual son, that there were false teachers active in Corinth. And they were undermining his work and questioning his authority as a servant 
of Jesus Christ. He was deeply and overwhelmingly concerned for the little lambs in his flock because they were being poisoned with false teaching. And I'm here to tell you, look, you guys are Baptists, you guys should definitely know the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon. The man had an amazing, crazy anointing of God. You know, he said in the late 1800s that the pulpits should house shepherds who feed the sheep. Instead, they're housing clowns entertaining the goats. Imagine if he was alive today. And we fall for it, don't we? In chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, Paul supports his apostleship with a great revelation he had. Remember when he said he knew a man who was taken to the third heavens, the very dwelling place of God? The first heavens being the atmospheric heavens, the sky, and then the next heavens being the stellar heavens, and the Bible speaks about the abode of God, the third heavens. He says, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. It was an ecstasis in Greek, where we get the word ecstasy from. He wished he didn't have to share it. That's why he said, I, I knew a man. He wouldn't even say, I. That's how humble he was. But it was necessary. He had to share it because of the current circumstances where the flock was being misled and hoodwinked by false teachers. Let's take a look at this first slide. I don't have too many scriptures for you tonight. I want to kind of do something else if you don't mind. 2 Corinthians 12, 6 through 7, it says, If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so, because I would be telling the truth. You know, Jeremiah speaks about in the ninth chapter, 24th verse, You that are rich, don't boast in your wealth. And you who are strong, don't boast in your strength. And you who are wise, don't boast in your wisdom. But if you're going to boast, boast that you know the Lord. I would be no fool in doing so, because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it, because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. I remember I went to see a, a famous worship leader. A guy called me, and um, he wanted to know about the Jewish roots of his faith. I'm not going to tell you who he is, but he's very well known. And I went to see him. And when he finished, he was pointing up because everybody's clapping. You know, I say this to the worship leaders. He went like this. And after the show, he said, what do you think? And I said, why did you assume they were clapping for you? <laughs> we had a very short friendship. <laughs> I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Meaning, you know, Paul didn't practice what he preached, he preached what he practiced. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, you know when you get a revelation from God, sometimes God doesn't want you to share that with anybody else. I have four children and I love to take them on separate vacations with me. I used to play a lot of basketball and I was great at man to man. If I guarded you, you weren't scoring. But when I played zone, so I do great with my kids man to man, but zone, once they flood the zone, I'm done. <laughs> he says, wonderful revelations. When you get a revelation from God, it's not always for you to tell everybody else. Why are we telling everybody else? So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan. Can God use Satan like that? Satan works for God. He has to get approval from God to attack. If he didn't need approval from God, we'd all be dead. A messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. So the, the apostle describes the thorn as a messenger from Satan that was pounding away at him, pounding at him to keep him from becoming proud. In one sense, it, it looks like it represents Satan's effort to hinder the work of the Lord. But God's greater than Satan. And God used that thorn to further his work by keeping Paul humble. Why would Paul become conceited? First of all, he had an encounter with Jesus personally. And then was commissioned directly by Jesus to preach the gospel. To the Gentiles. Secondarily, his missionary journeys were incredibly fruitful, planting congregations all over Asia Minor. Third, 
He had the power to perform signs and wonders so great. Remember we read that even his handkerchiefs and his aprons and acts, which he had touched, would be carried away to the sick or the demon-possessed, and they would be healed? And last, Paul was moved by the Holy Spirit to write much of the New Testament. Wow, what was that? And I thought, I thought it was my aneurysm for a minute. <laughs> Literally scared the light. I said, wow, is this how I'm going out? It's more than a thorn. Is everybody right over there? Yeah? Okay. The section beginning in verse 7 is really a most accurate description of the life of a servant of Messiah. It has its ups and downs. You have moments of deep humiliation, like the time at Damascus when they had a lower pole in a basket behind the wall. And then it has these mountaintop experiences, like his amazing journey to the third heavens. But normally, normally, after a servant of the Lord has enjoyed one of these mountaintop experiences, the Lord allows him to suffer some thorn in the flesh. And you know what I'm talking about. We as 21st century believers receive this all-important spiritual principle here. Successful service for Messiah depends on a weak servant. It's a maturation. Young people don't understand this principle. You know, I didn't really understand the principle because my dad was a rough, tough, I mean, I mean, man. You know, World War II, 18 years old, ranger, missing in action, purple heart, bronze star for bravery, marksman, lunatic. We didn't know from PTSD, but I knew from it because I lived with him. Good guy, but... Man, tough, 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 tough dude, tough dude. And he told me, be tough, kid. I mean, be tough. I lived in the projects, man, the real deal projects, one of the worst gun hill housing, one of the worst projects in the country. And you had to be tough to make it. You just had to be. And God forbid if I got into a fight and I got beat up and I came upstairs beat up, I'd have to deal with my dad. I mean, like, I got beat up by... Joey, and I'm getting beat up by you for getting beat up by Joey? It's crazy. And I thought when I came to the Lord, you know, I had this, this wonderful life. I had money. I had lots of social activity. Not good, but lots. I, I went to former, uh, uh, when, before Donald Trump was president, I went to one of his parties at his place at Trump Tower, and Tina Turner came out and sang. Yeah. I had the life, man, and everything was good. And then I met the Lord, and I gave my life to the Lord, and I thought, wow, I was such a bum, and my life was great, and now that I gave my life to the Lord, it's going to be fantastic. Survey says, <laughs> He took me down, piece by piece, everything I built, he ripped apart till I came to the base of Jesus, and he's been building me up ever since. Successful service for Messiah depends on a weak servant, and the weaker he is, the more power of Messiah accompanies his ministry and his preaching. All we can say for sure about this thorn is that it was some bodily trial which God had allowed to come into Paul's life. Rabbi Greg, how can you say that? Well, one, because I have the mic, because Scripture tells us so. Look at, look at the next couple of verses. It says three different times. Now, different times, that's important. Because people think that Paul just said, can you take it away? Can you take it away? No, it was spaced. It was spaced out. Three different times. So he had this for a long time. I begged the Lord to take it away. Have you ever begged the Lord to take something away? Maybe you're begging the Lord right now to take me away. I don't know. But each time he said, every time. And I've done this with God. Please. My grace is... Enough, kid. Seriously? My grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now, he says, I am glad to boast about my weaknesses. 
so that the power of Christ can work through me. Look at this word weaknesses. Of course, we have to look it up in a Greek lexicon. If you're looking at the Old Testament, and I recommend you study words all day long because the words in our English language don't suffice. When Isaiah says in Isaiah 43, 25, I'll give an example. I, the Lord, blot out your transgressions. What do you think? I think I'm at a little tea party with my pinky out. You know, blot. Blot means to annihilate, to exterminate, and to obliterate. You've got to look up the words in the Old Testament in the Hebrew lexicon. You've got to look up the words in the New Testament in the Greek. So this word, weakness, means infirmity of the body, sickness, an ailment, or a disease. So we know it was some physical. It's a thorn in the flesh. It's physical. So some speculate. I, I don't know how people do this. It's like the people that know exactly when Jesus is coming back. They and listen to me. They some of these people study eschatology. There's nothing wrong. There's everything right about eschatology. You might not know the day or the hour, but you should know the season. And guess what, Kang? Tis the season. But with that being said, there's people that study for 40 years, and they haven't figured out the day Jesus is coming back. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Jesus didn't know the day he was coming back. He certainly the Father does, but you know. Good deal. But anyway, some speculate, theologians, theologians are wonderful. They stroke their beard, they sit in a room, they argue over how to baptize. They're out of their minds. When Jesus comes back, I don't want him seeing me sitting in a room or seeing me singing songs. I want him to see me out in the street, out in the street sharing the gospel. Some speculate that it was an eye disease. Some speculate that it was malaria. Others say it was migraine headaches. The precise nature of the thorn has been concealed. God has concealed it so that afflicted souls and all afflicted throes throughout the ages can be encouraged and be helped by Paul's unnamed yet painful experience. Our trials may be different from Paul's, but they should produce the same exercise and they should produce the same fruit. 2 Corinthians 12, 8, 9, again, if I could look at it one more time. Three times I begged the Lord. Three times Paul prayed, pleaded. This isn't like, can you take it away? Like, this physical ailment he had was very painful. Tremendously pain. This was a tough guy. This was a guy who was stoned, who was beaten with rods, who was lashed 39 times. This must have been awful. He begged the Lord, beseeched the Lord, cried out to the Lord, please. Take it from me, God. And God answered Paul's prayer. But not the way Paul had hoped. In effect, God said, I will not remove the thorn, Paul. But I'll do something better. I will give you grace to bear it. And just remember, Paul, although I have not given you what you've asked for, I am giving you what you need. You want my power, and you want my strength to accompany your preaching, don't you? Well, the best way for that to happen is for you to be kept in a place of weakness. This was God's repeated answer to Paul's thrice prayer. And it continues to be his answer to his suffering people throughout the world. Better than the removal of trials and sufferings is the presence of Jesus in the midst of them. And the assurance of his strength and his enabling grace. The apostle is completely satisfied with the Lord's answer. Crazy. So he says, I'll gladly boast in my weaknesses if the Messiah would rest on me. Instead of complaining and grumbling about the thorn, he would get down on his hands and knees and thank God for it. He would gladly endure if the power of the Son of God would rest upon him. Last verse, the 10th verse in the same chapter. It says, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses. I mean, how in love with the Lord was this guy? And was his love for God just for him? Was he some superhuman? I mean, the difference between us and Jesus is simple. My father was biological. His father was God. He had a different level of anointing, no question about it. But Paul was a human being just like us. He said, so I take pleasure in my weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Naturally speaking, guys, and I'm talking naturally speaking, it's quite impossible for us to take pleasure in the type of experiences listed here. Weakness is a sickness, 
insults of personal attacks, mental anguish, hardships or disasters, persecutions or torture, and troubles or extreme affliction. But the key to understanding of this verse is found in the expression, for Christ. That's the key, for Christ. We should, we should as believers, be willing to endure in his cause and in the furtherance of his gospel. You know, I preached at an old Chinese church. I've preached at, you name it. And they were, they were children of the persecuted church in China in the 70s, the underground church, where everybody was persecuted. You know what they told me? I had an interpreter. In their language in Mandarin, they told me that their parents prayed every day on their knees for persecution. Who does that in America? Because they knew in persecution the gospel flourishes. Amazing. We, we would not ordinarily endure some things maybe for ourselves or for the sake of the loved ones, but for the sake of Christ, yes. It is when we are conscious of our own weakness and nothingness that we most depend on the power of God. I mean, pe people think I have this thing. I, I just don't understand what they're missing, man. I, I cry before I have to preach. I beg God not to. When, if somebody calls me, I, I thank God now that there's so many people watching streaming because I don't have to go to places. I'm not even comfortable. I have great angst. But I just trust the Lord. All I can do is lift him up. I can't draw anybody. That's his department. I can do my part, and he has to do his. So although brokenness... Brokenness, and some of you are broken. Some of you will be broken. Some of you might come out of brokenness just to go back into it. Some of you are very young and you don't even know what I'm talking about. But brokenness is seen as weakness to the world. But it's a sign of great strength to the believer. God's economy and the world's economy is at a great 180. 180, the world says, make your mark. God says, be dependent upon me. The world says, be strong. God says, be weak. It's the total antithesis. And we're often reminded that God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop. It takes broken clouds to bring rain. It takes broken grain to give bread. It takes broken bread to give strength. And it's a broken alabaster box that gives forth the sweetest perfume. Paul's opponents argued that Paul suffered way too much to be a true apostle. Paul argued that it was his weaknesses were the very means by which God and Messiah is made known to the world. Paul's suffering with thanksgiving and contentment manifests the resurrection power of the Spirit. Paul's endurance amid adversity and Christ-like behavior in the midst of it made possible by the grace of God, are the greatest display of God's presence, power, and glory in this fallen world. When you give praise in the midst of your suffering, it's a great way to silence the enemy. No one likes to live in pain. No one. In fact, Paul sought the Lord three times, so he's not superhuman, to remove the pain from him. He probably had many good reasons. I have many good reasons. I do. I mean... He could have a more effective ministry. He could reach more people with the gospel. He could glorify God even more. But the Lord was more concerned about building Paul's character and preventing pride. Instead of removing the problem, God gave Paul more overwhelming grace and more compensating strength. And look what we do today. He would never think that I'd be talking about him. Never. When he wrote these little letters, that would carry to these little penny any congregations, not massive, 30, 40 people in a distant land. Do you think 2,000 years later he would think we'd be talking about it? No way. The exact nature of Paul's thorn in the flesh is uncertain. I believe God wanted Paul's difficulty to be described in a general way so that we can apply it to any difficulty we're facing now. Whether the thorn we struggle with is physical or mental or spiritual or a combination thereof, we can know God has a purpose for it and that his grace is all we need. I was reading before I came here in Isaiah 66, 
1, 2. Isaiah's amazing prophecy. The whole, the whole book is amazing. He was a prophet's prophet. He was from a royal line. I mean, he got commissioned by God himself. He saw God high and lifted up with his robe filled the temple. There's a reason for that in Judaic thinking. And there are 66 chapters in Isaiah, and there are 66 books in our Bible. The first 39 chapters in Isaiah talks about a sin problem. The next 27, starting with chapter 40, talks about the answer to that sin problem, the Messiah. The 39 books in the Old Testament talks about a sin problem. The New Testament gives us the answer to that sin problem. 27 times Isaiah speaks about salvation, more than all the other prophets put together. But in the 66th chapter, it's the culmination, which speaks about the new heavens and the new earth. And God says through Isaiah, heaven is my throne room and earth is my footstool. So what kind of house can you build me that's going to attract me? He says, but I'll tell you who can approach me. The kind of person on whom I look with favor, a.k.a. the person I'll bless. This is the person that God will bless. Those who are poor and humble in spirit and those who tremble at my word. Poor and humble in spirit, the word is ani in Hebrew, and it means needy and weak. God, that's, that's what you want to bless, somebody needy and weak? No, today, it's, it's cool, man. I got to get the cool haircut, the cool clothes, the cool watch. Dude, if you saw my friends in India, 18 of them were burned in their chairs because of preaching the gospel. That's not cool, is it? He said, tremble at my word. What does that mean? When you hear the word, you tremble? No, no. It's chorad in Hebrew, and it means to love what God loves and to hate what he hates. There are three things that will bring a man of God and a woman of God down. And I don't mean a preacher. I mean a believer. I call them the three Gs. Gold, girls, and glory. For you guys, it's gold, guys, and glory. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money. I can't build schools. Do you know, do you know I'm going to tell you something. This is the God's honest truth. I have never preached a sermon about money in the 18 years I'm at Beth Yeshua. I have never done a series or a teaching on tithing. I have never once asked, if this has been a blessing to you, would you consider not once? And I'm just going to be honest with you. We have a plethora of people giving. Money that I was able to refurbish a whole children's village in Israel this year, a million dollars. And it didn't hurt us one iota. Isn't that nice? God's will, God's bill. If God's behind it, he's going to provide the funds. Be careful about the love of money. Girls, guys, they'll bring you down every day. Wait on the Lord, man. Wait on the Lord. You're going you're gonna to make a bad decision. Fall in love with him and find somebody who's more in love with him than he is with you, and you'll have a good relationship. And last and not least, the most insidious is glory. God is merciful and kind and doesn't pay us back as our sins deserve. But let me tell you where he draws the line in the sand. Don't mess with his glory. He won't share it with no one. Do not, do not, do not try to take the glory. It's not a good idea. Those are fighting words to God. When you see the cross of Christ where love and truth have met each other and peace and justice have kissed each other, how could you take any glory? How dare we? But by the same token, God must discredit all idols to receive his proper honor. He is not one of many. He is not superior among inferior gods. He is not even the best of all. He is the one and only true God. And he will have his people know that and rejoice in that truth. Therefore, he uses the weak to shame the strong. And he uses the fool to shame the wise. And it's in our weakness that he is strong. It's in our weakness that we find God's grace where we most need it. I always tell people, like Jacob, don't change your limp for a strut. 
don't change your limp for a strut. Because every time I try to get ahead of myself and feel like it's the old Greg again, I get slammed once again. I just can't seem to get past that, you know? I, I, I try to go back to some of my secular days when I was the athlete, when I had it together, you know, when I was sure of myself and confident. That's not what God wants. So if you're broken, if you feel broken, you're attractive to God. You know, this last trip we went to Israel, I want to tell you a quickie story, and then we'll come to a close. I had 150 people there. Like I said, 120 I've never met. They just watch online. They came from 25 states and four countries. And I met them for the first time, and I took them to a mountain the first morning when they got there. And um, beautiful view of the Galilee, beautiful view of Mount Hermon, beautiful view of the Valley of Armageddon. We'll have the final battle. Just magnificent. And I said to them, guys, I think we focus on Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. And is that important? It's the most important thing. But what I don't think we focus on enough is his life. We're supposed to replicate him. We're supposed to live like him. And it's not hard. The Gospels, you know, he only said 1,800 sentences because three are synoptic. Only 1,800 sentences. That's all we have. We have him when he's born as an infant. And then we see him one day when he's 12 in the temple. And then we catch him for a few years. And we don't have every day of him. Just a few days. So it's really not hard to follow. I said, there's three things that stand out about Jesus that attracts me. One, his humility. He says he's humble of heart. I mean, the man was so humble, and if anybody didn't have to be humble, it was him. The second thing, he was a servant. I don't understand how we think we should be served. Some pastors think they should be served. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. If anybody should have been served, it should have been him. And last but not least, everything he did, and listen to me, everything from his teachings to his signs to his wonders to his miracles was born out of compassion. Totally born out of compassion. So here he was, this humble, compassionate servant. I told them, if you take this week and live like him, you will attract the Holy Spirit. You will attract the Holy Spirit. You will bring the Spirit in your tabernacle. And I said, if 150 of you do this, the Holy Spirit is going to manifest itself on this trip like nothing unprecedented. And lo and behold, they did. And I would tell you to do this. Guys, you want to attract the Holy Spirit. You need the power. Some of you are gifted. Some of you have gifting. God has gifted all of us. But to move in our own strength is crazy. And to try to beat sin? Satan is so on the warpath these days. He's coming after your marriages. He's coming after your kids. Back in the day, if a kid wanted to look at pornography, he had to sneak it somewhere. Hide it in the woods. Now it's 24-7. And he's coming, and he's coming, and he's coming, and he's relentless. You see it. You see it. It's a power that we have to fight. But how are you going to fight the power if you don't have the power to fight? A form of religion, but denying the power. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, and there's things that we do to attract it, and there's things we do to repel it. I think tonight, tomorrow, I just, you know, Brother Chuck said, what, what should we do? Do you think, you know, the church is all closed today in, in Megan? The governor said, shut them down. So Chuck said, do you think we should have the conference tomorrow? I said, well, well what am I going to do? I got nothing to do. I'm leaving Tuesday. You know, he goes, okay, nice decision making. <laughs> but tomorrow, I, I want to leave on a high note. I want to talk to you about this incredible thing called the resurrection. Incredible, incredible thing called the resurrection. But tonight, I want to give you the opportunity. This Cliff is here and Chuck is here and a few others, I want to give you the opportunity that if you just feel broken beyond repair, if you feel like things are just not going well, God says his house should be a house of prayer for all nations. I hate to just put on a song and dance. So if maybe some of the worship guys can come up and play and sing a little bit. We don't need the whole choir. I hate to put you on the spot like this, but man, that's kind of how I operate. 
and we can get some guys up here to pray. Take the opportunity. If you just want to be in the Lord's presence, be in the Lord's presence. But if you need prayer, don't listen, there's an anointing here tonight for this. There is. Don't belittle the power of prayer. Don't leave here if you need prayer about something. Whatever it is. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's for a job. I don't care if it's angst. I don't care what it is. Take this opportunity and have these people pray for you tonight. and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow strength indeed is small 
child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He it white as snow. stain he washed it white as snow in the in the lord good to us tonight praise the lord There are some folks who chose not to come, and for various reasons, and I'm just thankful that you came, because by you coming, you brought the Holy Spirit with you, and the Holy Spirit has met with us. Do not take that for granted. Just because we show up doesn't mean that he shows up, and that he is having his work in What the Bible says is the Spirit of the Lord is at work, then there will be a freedom. We will meet tomorrow night, so just uh, plan on it, pray about it. You may say, well, I, I'm busy. Uh, you got no ball games. Uh, half of you are not employed anymore. Uh, you know, you can't go to the theater, you know. <laughs> and why are all of us going to restaurants? I don't know. <laughs> so you got, a lot of you do have, let's be honest, you got some extra free time. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? So uh, come back and bring somebody with you. And I just want to say thank the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greg. You are a blessing. And I just want everybody to know, I love you more than you love me. I've endured your friendship. I just want to, no. <laughs> oh, thank you. Offering tonight. I'm not preaching on money, but I do want you to give a lot. So, uh this ministry he has goes all over the world, and folks, you cannot believe, he, he is not exaggerating when he said a million dollars was invested in an orphanage, what, two months ago, two months ago in Israel, for um, these kids that are severely deformed, and no one wants them, and he and his ministry have bought specialized wheelchairs, am I getting this close? so that, that some of them are, for the first time, able to, to communicate. They have lived in a prison, and others had no way of getting around. And so this ministry just was so powerful in Israel. They're like, who is this guy? And guess what? God is using this as a platform to share the gospel. You talk about, you talk about investing in eternity. Praise the Lord. Well, let's stand, and we will be dismissed. Uh, touch elbows. Uh, and I don't know what to do anymore. Lord, help us. I don't know. Oh, would you please come pray over us again? Are you, will you do that again? You got it. All right. <laughs> the risk is whatever you ask me to do, I would do. So I got to be really careful around yeah. you, <laughs> don't I? Hey, guys, seriously, it's, it's a blessing to see all of you out. And, um, you know, I know you don't really know me that well, but I, I do love you. And I do have a great deal of respect for you. And I know the hardest thing I've ever done in my life is to be a legitimate believer. Mm. It, it's just so, it's not natural for me. So 
I just I take my hats off to you because I, I could see your souls and I could see that you're doing the best you can and God is very impressed. This is a great church, man. It really is. Mm. And it's a blessing for you to be here. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua. <laughs> Shalom. Drive safe. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning into our live stream today. I believe with all of my heart that you experience God's faithfulness and goodness today. You know, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. If you need to respond to the Lord today, I believe that's real easy. It's called HBO, not the channel, but I believe HBO stands for this. You hear, you believe, and you obey. You just heard the word of God spoken clearly through our pastor today. Do you believe that? If you believe it, then what God is calling you to do right now is to obey the word. If you need help and you want to talk to somebody, please contact us via our website or our Facebook page. One of our pastors would love to help you in your walk with the Lord. Thank you and God bless you.